Hey everybody, Jason here in real life today. Going to be doing something a little different. Today is entirely focused on the things that I have learned over the last 11 years being a poker pro to improve my efficiency, to avoid making big mistakes. This will be focused on anything from gameplay to bonehead account accounting mistakes that I've made or travel mistakes or anything that I, I believe has increased the value of my career. And a lot of good things have happened over the course of a decade. And in between all of those good things, there's been a bunch of bumpy mistakes and a bunch of ambiguity. And that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to offer you a little bit of advice if you're a recreational player and you're subscribed to Run It Once to get better at sit and goes or to be better at heads up no limit or PLO and you're just playing for fun, this video isn't for you. It's directed towards every person out there who's doing their best to make a living playing poker. And on top of that, if you're, I'm 33 years old, if you've been doing this for 12 years, you probably have figured out most of the stuff that I'm going to offer as advice in this video. So let's get started. The first area I'm going to cover is on gameplay and pressure. This isn't just executing your best at a final table, this is just consistently playing the best that you can. It's really important to be in the right state of mind before you go play. Recently in a trip, on a trip to South Korea, uh, I was playing in Jeju and it's about 3 in the morning, I get a phone call, and I roll out of bed, I've been sleeping about an hour, and I sprint down to the cash game room, and the next thing I know I'm playing in one of the biggest games I've ever played. Uh, maybe the biggest game I've ever played. And I remember for the next 30 minutes trying to, I was having trouble counting what the, the, the anti-structures that we play, they often change. And I was trying really hard to figure out, okay, what, what exactly are we playing? First hand, I was all in, and uh, I, I was miscounting the size of the pot. In the biggest game that I'd ever played. And uh, it's really important that you take a couple seconds, take some deep breaths, move your body a little bit, and get the blood flowing before you roll into this. This, this is the same thing as waking up a little late to roll into a tournament. Uh, if you haven't registered, I think that there's generally more EV in you showing up to a tournament 10 minutes late and taking the 10 minutes uh, where you're driving slow, you're not speeding through traffic, getting yourself stressed out, and you're also listening to one or two songs that kind of get you a little pumped up. Nothing more than that. You don't want to go crazy on the music. And uh, visualizing yourself playing your best. Um, not being rushed and... Um, being able to calibrate your brain is such a very big deal. The visualization thing, um, it isn't black magic, it isn't nonsense, it's a very real thing. It applies to every competitive avenue. You want to envision yourself doing your best or winning a gold bracelet or a trophy, or putting a solid 12-hour cash game session in. These things kind of bring big, terrifying goals down to earth. They make them feel tangible. And I can tell you, as somebody who has done some things in poker that I never imagined I would do, remember in the beginning watching Rail Heaven being like, oh my God, you know, uh, will I ever get to meet the guys that play those stakes and you know now I'm here now I'm doing it and it's the same for all of these athletes you can hear the story isn't isn't a rare one it's it's a common story of you have a goal you imagine yourself doing it you work hard you maintain the work ethic the focus and the next thing you know one day you wake up and you're there um, it's really important to maintain this focus for the long term and not just be destroyed when something doesn't work out for you. Poker, as we all know, is a game where things oftentimes aren't going to work out. There were 
if you look at the beginning course of my life tournament career, it felt like years before I'd won a tournament. And so much of that was just luck-based. Sure, I wasn't nearly as strong at the game, but relative to the general field and the lower stakes that I was playing, I was doing fine. Um, but I remember every time I would bust, I would just be like, oh, damn, that was my last chance at this or that. Just these completely irrelevant, irrational thoughts. And I'm sure we all have them, and we all have these kind of inferiority complexes where we we feel like, oh, we're not good enough to win or whatever. But that's all nonsense. You just have to continue coming back, and you have to realize the game that you signed up for is one that doesn't reward uh, it doesn't reward you in the short term. It's well, it may sometimes, but it, it doesn't always. So stay focused on the long term picture, and if you're passionate about looking into the game and studying and playing and talking about it with friends and traveling to play it, uh, it's really just a who sticks around the longest without making catastrophic mistakes. Those are the people that will make it. It's it's no it's no secret success formula. It's hard work and consistency and damage control when things aren't going your way. So you're at these final tables for the first time and you're trying to do your best to execute what you've practiced and things are new and you're scared and you make mistakes and you feel like a failure. I've done that like a thousand times. What you have to understand is you are gaining experience. You will get to the point where the stakes don't hurt anymore. You're not afraid. Uh, you're not afraid to pull the trigger at a final table. And you have a collection of memories that you can access to do your best. So get there, play your ass off, prepare, but understand that you have to take licks to be ready for the good stuff. A good buddy of mine who made a great career out of poker and was crushing high stakes with uh, all the legends like Phil and Tom back in the day, David Benefield. Uh, my first Macau trip, I went with him, and this was years ago. And I played, and I think the trip went well, but in the beginning, Things went slow, and I was playing big for, for myself at the time, and I lost a bunch. I was talking to Dave, and I was shook. And self-admittedly, I get more shook than the average player. I always have. Uh, um, at least I would say I get more uh, down on myself whenever things aren't going the way that I, I want them to, and it's an area that I've had to work really hard at controlling. But... Something resonated with me whenever I asked David Benefield. I said, "Hey, man, how do you how do you deal with this? You know, you're swinging seven figures a week, sometimes seven figures a day. Uh, you know, and in the beginning, even online, I remember you just uh, the ups and downs were huge." And he said, "Man, in the beginning, it was felt like I was drowning, but you just keep doing something until it doesn't hurt anymore." And there's also a really valuable video that I suggest all of you watch. It was uh, Phil made it years ago. And the title of the video is called Sometimes I Lose. So fire that up on Google and listen to Phil go on one of these uplifting rants, I believe the day after he got absolutely demolished online. Part two of Advice from Old Man Coon. This is uh, on travel. And from there, I'll cover a few financial things that I totally screwed up in the beginning of my career. So travel-wise, everyone travels to these poker tournaments uh, not giving themselves nearly enough time to acclimate. If you're going to a different time zone, especially halfway around the world, uh, get there early. I'm not going to go crazy on this, but it just blows my mind how many people show up to play gigantic tournaments on uh, one day acclimation to an eight hour time zone. That's just not gonna work for you. You're gonna sleep like shit and you're gonna play C game. Um, the next mistake that I always see people make and that I made a ton in the beginning of my career is they see a big main event and they say, oh yeah, there's $2 million for first. I gotta travel to that stop and try to bank off that 2 million bucks. That isn't the way you should look at it. Look at it 
as an energy-based thing. Look at it as the financial cost of your travel minus your overall ROI in the tournament. Look at the average amount of hours that you're going to have invested into this thing and try to get a rough idea of what the trip's worth to you before you just jump on a plane and, and go over there. Uh, your time is really valuable and time learning, even though it's not money in your pocket immediately, is often uh, a much better choice than flying halfway around the country or, or the halfway around the world, whatever it may be, and blowing up all your energy and time and expense uh, to play some very average main event. On the, uh, the financial thing, uh, keep solid notes. My God, keep solid notes. Uh, for the first X amount of years of my poker career, I think I was keeping notes in like a, my, my actual iPhone notes thing. I don't even know if I was backing it up on the cloud. It was insane. Now, this was a long time ago, but I can tell you I made tons of mistakes. Uh, with your transactions that you make, even if it's just handing somebody a $100 chip at the Rio, um, make sure you send them a text and say, hey, paid you in chips at the Rio, A25, whatever. Also, what I do is I keep a running WhatsApp chat with myself, and I text myself every single financial transaction I make. An example would be, uh, you know, if, if you lost a last longer first me at the World Series, you would say something like, pay Jason 1.5K in Rio chips, uh, on 725 because I last I lost a last longer it's a tongue twister uh, during the WSOP so be more detailed than just paid you 500 say paid you 500 for this or that um, these things really will come back to save you time and time again I've made so many mistakes that have cost me a ton of money um, also a lot of people are swapping nowadays and playing bigger buy-ins so if you're swapping with people make sure you have the tech the uh, tax situation figured out ahead of time and also make sure you have rebuys you know you need to say yo are we swapping rebuys at face or are we not rebuying each other on bullet two it would be a tragedy for you to have it in your head that you've only swapped in uh one bullet and then on bullet two of 1500 you win and guys taking you to arbitration to pay them 10k or whatever it was for your swap all right so if you're going to stick around in poker you've got to have balance that doesn't mean that there aren't phases of your career where you should just be going crazy and doing nothing but studying or nothing but playing. Right now, this phase of my career, I, I feel good about the game and there's opportunities that present themselves to me that won't be around forever. So I understand, hey, you know, you got to get it while the getting's good. And that's definitely true. And that sometimes means long sessions or long trips. But make sure you have scheduled breaks uh you you've thought about and committed to breaks that you're going to take once say you're done playing the world series or an ept or a, uh, a party stop or whatever it may be i think of someone like eric seidel who uh, i've developed a close friendship with over the years playing playing in the tournaments and i i see him you know he's been crushing poker for 40 years and he still has time to fly to San Fran and grab dinner with his, his daughter or hang out with his wife on a regular basis and uh, enjoy shows, whatever it may be. The reason the guy is still around 40 years later is because he loves poker and he loves to compete, but at the same time, he's, he's not one of these degenerates who's just inside of a casino 350 days a year. It's just entirely unsustainable. Um, listen to your body. That's, that's a really big one. Uh, whenever I'm feeling it, I'm going to go hard, but if I'm not feeling it anymore, I'm, I'm totally cool to take a break. And, you know, I did that this year in the middle of the World Series. I just took two weeks off. Uh, I was thinking to myself, man, I, I just absolutely need to breathe some fresh air. So, you know, I went to Cali for a few days, and I think it paid big dividends for the end of my summer. I'm not here to tell you that you have to be some kind of extreme athlete to play great poker. That's obviously not the case. A lot of the best poker players are in pretty piss poor shape. Um, what I would suggest to you, though, is have something where you're moving around. Uh, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Uh, sure, you can have focused workouts, and that will improve the efficiency of your time. But more than anything, it's just about committing to getting in somewhere and, and doing something once in a while. You've got to respect your body. You've got to take care of yourself, especially if 
you're sitting in these chairs for you know 12 hour sessions i can tell you you know I've, I've taken pretty good care of myself over the years and at 33 i already feel a lot of issues from being in a chair uh, that's why i'm standing here right now actually I, I do my best to stand as much as i possibly can um I think I already mentioned walking outside, but I, I'm really crazy about nature therapy. Uh, and generally we have the luxury to be able to step outside no matter where we're at playing poker. So if you're not into doing uh, squats and power cleans and lots of hard cardio or whatever, you're gonna get a ton of benefit just from getting outside, walking for a couple of hours, an hour here and there. Uh, really commit to that. These are, you know, these aren't tedious things. That is something I really look forward to doing is getting outside and walking around. Some of the most outstanding memories I have from early in my poker career are centered around me battling it out with other regs uh, in online tournaments and uh, online sit and goes, whatever it was that I was playing. And those rivalries uh, fueled all of us to get a little better. And over time, you develop so much respect for the people that you once had friction with, that you were once going to war with, that you once may have had some friendly or unfriendly banter with. And I just think it's so important to take a step back and have the understanding that we're all in here mutually trying to gamble for a living. On top of that, we have governments blocking us from playing online poker against one another. We have massive taxes and bad tax incentives. Uh, there's a lot of things that make gambling hard. It, not only is it strategically difficult, it's just really, really difficult to make a living at. And if we're all here trying to do that, you have to share respect for each other. And you have to make this world one that's inviting for the recreational player. We can't be time banking for 45 seconds pre-flop at the World Series of Poker in a 1500 when there's three wrecks there. You guys, we have to treat them as if we're hosts uh, we are ambassadors to the game. You are an ambassador to the game. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't let your personality shine. That doesn't mean that, you know, if you're an introvert, you don't have to be out there dancing and trying to tell jokes at the table. Uh, most of us in poker are somewhat awkward. That's the way this works. We're gamers, you know. And uh, in order to be good at this game, we're overclocked in some ways and underclocked in others. And uh, you just got to love all the weirdness that's out there. Uh, and absolutely embrace it and respect people. Um, on top of this, I, I think about some of the di most difficult times in my poker career where financially uh, I may have blew up a bunch of money being a complete jackass trying to prove to the world that I'd made it and out there buying Porsches and spending money in clubs and sitting there at the club wondering like, how do people think this is fun? This is, this is miserable. Um, and my back was against the wall uh, at some points in my career. And I had some friends that took care of me. Uh, but I remember I never sold out. And there were, there were times where I could have been a real piece of garbage. And I think that when you feel like you're drowning and you feel like times are tough, you may want to take the easy way out and scum people. I, I backed a guy uh, in the very earliest part of my career that I grew up playing t-ball with. And this guy ends up robbing me for $12,000 and disappearing. And I just think, wow, we got off cheap. Uh, me and another buddy are the ones who got, got backing him. And uh, you just think about these sellouts. And you think about, you know, it is tough when you're, when you're broke or when things uh, aren't going your way. But you have power through a network, through people that are out there playing the same game that you are. And if you keep your integrity you have a much bigger bankroll than what is readily available to you at your time. Even if you're not backed, if you have a reputation as being an honorable, hardworking person, you're gonna stay in business. And if you stay in business and you really want to play poker for a living, you will succeed. It's not too late. Sure, solvers have made the game more difficult, but if you look for value and you approach the game like a professional, uh, you're gonna find ways to win. And if that isn't what you want, because it's a really hard way to make a living, uh, that's cool too. And I would recommend, you know, not feeling like a failure and, and it's, it's cool to move on. Uh, without that passion, you're basically drawing dead to make it. So this is going to conclude the video part of this post. I want to open up the comments section and create an active forum 
Since the video is available to Essential and Elite members, I thought it would be a great idea for us all to post comments and questions and feed off of one another to create a small archive of advice that will be available to all the Run It Once members in the future. So hopefully I'll see you in there. This is Jason and I'll catch you guys next time.